Praise the Lord and good evening to everyone. Praise the Lord and good evening. I hope you're doing well. Let's take a few minutes to greet each other and let everyone know you're here in the chat and then we'll get into our study for this evening. All right. I hope you can hear me. Um, let me know how it's coming through online if you can and can't hear me. Uh, I would greatly appreciate it just to make sure everything is uh, being communicated appropriately. Just let me know how the sound is and how everything is happening here. So it's good to see everyone. Let's take a few minutes. We're going to get right into our study for this evening and then we're going to um, close out our final chapter on the book or in the book of Revelation. All right. And if I had my little mixer and all my my whole setup i would give us a big round of applause applause there but um i'm just gonna have to <laughs> give us that for the night all right we made it through the entire book of revelation and man what a journey it has been it hasn't been uh, the smoothest journey just because we've been doing some things breaking up some things but um yeah, we made it. We're here. So let's see who do we have in the comment box, and then we're gonna get right into our into our study for the evening. All right, praise the Lord, Sister Neely. Good to see you. Praise the Lord, Sister Stevens. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Um, praise the Lord, Mama. Good to see you. Thank you for joining us. Okay, great. The sound is good. Praise the Lord, baby. Good to see you tonight. Got my wife joining us tonight. Thank you so much. And um, good to see everyone. Praise the Lord, Sister Flagger. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a little bit different tonight as far as our presentation is concerned because I'm actually traveling and I am in Accra, um, Ghana, in Africa this week. And um, it is currently 10.35 p.m. over here where I am. And um, I know if you're in the East Coast, it's 6.30. And um, if you're other places, it's going to be a little bit earlier. But... Uh, I, I I can't you know to be honest with you I think this is a tremendous way to um, to end the live the schedule permitted us to actually come on as we have been um, doing our outreach uh, services every Sunday at six o'clock this gives us time to actually come on live as as somewhat of a finale to to ch close out this study in the Book of Revelation and. Um, and then next Sunday, we'll be back together live in person at 6 o'clock at 1215 Calhoun Street in Columbia, South Carolina. And um, we're going to start some other studies as the year will go on. Um, right now, we're reading through the Gospel of Mark. And um, while it is a very familiar book of the Bible, you know, I, on my travel here I've been reading through the book and I, I'm just amazed at all the little things that I picked up just reading it all the way through um, and just marking as I as I read and so we're considering that I look forward to sharing some things from the book of the Gospel of Mark in the upcoming weeks but we'll, we'll see what our next study will be we'll probably start on a more official uh, uh, study in the month of January as we go into the new year but um, we really want to invite you, if you're in the area, to come on out to uh, Selfless uh, every Sunday at 6 o'clock. Last week, we were able to serve 27 members of the community with food and and uh, uh, food packets. And it was just an amazing uh, interaction with, with the community there and with um, everyone that was a part of helping us serve. So uh, next week, we're going to have Fall Fest, if you have children. Um, you can bring your children out. They'll eat for free. Grandchildren eat for free, play for free, enjoy all the festivities. And so um, now we're currently up to about 35 citizens we've served um, over the last couple of weeks. And the word is getting out and, and the community is really thankful and grateful for the things that we're doing. So uh, if you're in the area, please jump jump in and, and be a part of all that's happening. I think it's going to be a blessing to you as you fulfill God's word. And then also, and of, of course, be a blessing to those that uh, who, who you will serve. So, friends, um, let's get into our study. We're in Revelation chapter 22. We've made, I can't believe we're, we're at the end of this. And what an incredible time to end this, this book and uh, kind of review 
the things that we've read over the last uh, 22 weeks plus. It's been a little longer than that. So let's kind of review and let's kind of take a little step back and just understand and take this entire book in. Okay. So when we think about the book of Revelation, it is the New Testament's exile book. So if you have in the Old Testament, the exilic period where Daniel, Zechariah, Malachi, Jeremiah, Haggai, or Haggai, as some people will pronounce it, um, those prophets are speaking during a period of oppression and exile. The mirror to that, the parallel to that in the New Testament is essentially the book of Revelation. That is the context. And in this book is the unveiling of the Son of God. Now, what is interesting is that during a period where the people of God are experiencing exile, that is separation from God, separation from the covenant, they are experiencing oppression, if you will. God decides to reveal, or maybe should I say in, in the more literal terms, unveil himself so that they can see who he really is and what he really means to the people of God. Praise the Lord, Sister Burris. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for joining us. And so this book is, is significant in so many, and for so many reasons, and it is very important for us to remember as we come to the last chapter, chapters 2 and chapters 3, or chapter 2 and chapter 3, excuse me, because in those two chapters, we find that this letter is written to seven churches who are going through this period, and they need to have some sort of hope that they can hold on to to continue their commitment to the Lord and their stand against the pagan imperial rule okay so when we think about this it's, it's more than just saying okay what is going to happen in in the few days ahead but there, there's an entire context in which these prophecies uh, have a home they, they, they rest in the context of Israel or excuse me yeah Israel first being a part of the fulfillment of a covenant that once existed, but also the coming out or the coming forth of a new covenant that will begin and have its root in Jesus Christ. All of these things, and there are so many different little, you know, antennas and, and, and branches that we can, or roads that we can go down, but that's the meat of it, all right? So last week, we talked about uh, the New Jerusalem, and I hope you had a chance to look over that video. If you haven't, just take a chance maybe sometime in the early part of the week to just take, you know, read over and uh, listen to the video on Revelation chapter 21. But let me just go back for a moment because in Revelation chapter 20, we have a thousand year period. Then we have in 21, the coming of a new Jerusalem or restoration for Jerusalem. And then in 22, we'll find that we have the eternal establishment of God's reign and rule and the ultimate deliverance of God's people from their enemies. Now, this is the same timeline that we find in the Old Testament prophets. Remember in the book of Daniel, we have a period where the uh, people of God will rule. The people of God are under oppression in some instances. Uh, the oppressing nations have their day, if you will, to oppress God's people. But then comes restoration renovation and redemption for the people of God with the anticipation of there being a rule of God in the land that allow them to worship as they've always worshiped. So literally, as we find in the New Testament, there's this symbolism uh, or this uh, parallel to the Old Testament idea of Exodus, right? Where God is freeing the people of God from literal enemies and oppressive nations and people and where that same idea is now taken into consideration and used in the new testament to depict the salvation that god's people receive through jesus christ that is the freedom from sin death and the power of satan the same way we find that idea being used in the new testament concerning our salvation is the way the writer john is using the principle or the idea of exile to communicate to the people who are in Patmos or these seven churches about how they're going to be freed from oppressive nations as they go through periods of oppression with the hopes of one day being freed to live in the eternal rule of God as it has been predicted by the prophets. 
And the best way to depict this is by using the very words of the prophets who talked about days of redemption for the nation of Israel as they were leaving the literal exile from nations such as or people such as the Babylonians, the Grecians, the Persians, and then now essentially the Romans. All right. Praise the Lord, Smith. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for joining us. So if you can imagine and you can think about what's happening in this text, you, you, you see that there is a physical example that serves as the basis for a spiritual reality. That is what happened in the physical is essentially what John is trying to portray is happening spiritually for the nation of Israel. It's called shadows and types in the study of the Bible. All right. So let's look into uh, Revelation chapter 22 and let's see how this all uh, unfolds as we are closing out this incredible book. All right. So notice here he says, then he showed me the river of the water of life. So right here we have some words that we want to pay attention to. We can't ignore the words here, okay? Because every time we see things that sound familiar, that look familiar, we need to just see what the Spirit is doing and trying to help us understand from a pictorial or should I say a visual perspective. What does it look like for God to redeem his people and defeat death? A feat of defeat oppression and the enemies of his people well it looks like a river of the word of life that's what it looks like if you wanted to explain that that's the word that they were used for us it might seem a bit uh, antiquated but for them it made perfect sense because they had several reference points where they could understand what it means whenever the word river of the word of life is used all right they would have known exactly what he was getting at. In fact, when you look at the New Testament, or the, excuse me, the Old Testament, one of the first things that is spoken of is this river flowing from the Garden of Eden, if you will. And, and when we look in Genesis chapter 2, just give you an example. Genesis chapter 2, verse 10. If Eden is the perfect place to exist, and the Garden of, or excuse me, the uh, promised land is supposed to be a sort of parallel to that, then essentially what he's saying is that we are going to a land where there is life. We're going to a place where we can find life. And that's the point of the reference itself. If you look at uh, Genesis chapter 2, verse 10, notice how it speaks about the river that went out from Eden to water the garden. From there it divided and became the source of four rivers. And you see, if you think about water in this ancient time, water is a precious a precious resource, not only for bathing, but for drinking and inhabiting or ingesting, should I say. And if you had water that you can, you know, drink and, and not only use for, for cleansing purposes, then it was very rare and it was something to be very, uh, to be valued. Um, we find also, as we look in this passage, that there are references to uh, the water of life or the river of life in Psalm chapter 46, verse 4. All right, and these are just, again, pictures that would have flashed in their mind as they are hearing about a river of, of life. Notice what, how the psalmist writes about this river, this idea, this concept of a river. There's a river. It streams to light the city of God, the holy dwelling place of the Most High. Jeremiah chapter 2, verse 13. All right, let me see here. 13. Notice what happens here. My people have committed a double evil. They have abandoned me, the fountain of living water. So you see God himself is depicted as a fountain of living water. Praise the Lord, not Bessie. Good to see you tonight. Thank you for joining us. And they dug cisterns for themselves and cracked cisterns that cannot hold water. So you, you see the, the way water is referenced. It's not only, it's, it's not the, the idea of a, a literal river that they're, you know, trying to go to, but it is the idea behind these different usages of the word or the phrase or the idea the fact that God himself is seen as a river of life or a living water if you will here's another one the Lord of hope of Israel all who abandon you will, will be put to shame all who turn away from the from me will be written in the dirt for they have abandoned the Lord the fountain of living water so when Jesus comes along and he calls 
to remind this idea, okay, of living water. Notice what he's doing. He's playing on the prior uh, the prior references that the prophets used to living water, that being God himself, if you will. This is why he says to the woman at the well, when she's trying to dig up this water, right, from the well, and she's like, you know, I need this water that, that, that you know, will lead to eternal life. Well, Jesus says here, if you knew the gift of God who is saying to you, give me a drink, you would ask of him and he would give you living water. You see, Jesus is playing on this idea, this concept. These are not just references or pictures that, you know, John is creating for himself. Everything in this passage is pointing back to something that was said in the Old Testament that built a concept or an idea for the people living during this time to help them imagine the value. And that's the key word, imagination, the value of what they are going to inherit by following Jesus Christ. All right. Hope that makes sense. All right. So these are not just, you know, things that he's just coming up with being creative. He's the spirit, should I say, is pointing back to things that were written so that there can be a, a broader understanding of the value of the things that are being said. All right. So let's go a little further. Now, it says that this river is clear as crystal. All right. If you remember in Ezekiel chapter 47, verse 12. We hear references about, uh, or rather, even the entire book of, of, of uh, Ezekiel that speaks about the throne of God. You remember the river that is re referred to as being clear as crystal or like glass, if you will. And you see that same picture showing up in Revelation chapter 22, where he's saying that it is flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. So people hearing this or he hearing this being read would have said, oh my goodness, John is seeing the God of Ezekiel the God that was depicted in the book of Ezekiel, who also uh, lived during a time of exile. And that same God that showed up for them, knowing and understanding the history of what God did for Israel as he freed them from the Persians at that time, God is doing the same thing for them, except this time he's not using Cyrus, he's using his son Jesus Christ to bring the deliverance. All right, so let's go a little further. Let's see what else. He has to say, he says, down the middle of the city's main street, the tree of life. Look at this phrase. Isn't that interesting? How in the world do we get here? So we know what he's doing here. Whenever he's referencing the tree of life was on each side of the river, bearing 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit every month. The leaves of the tree are for healing. Look at this for the healing of the nations. Now, we never saw that before. And this is the beauty of Jesus Christ. You see what Jesus does in the Bible is things, he, he doesn't necessarily create new things, but he creates an opportunity to access things that we wouldn't have had permission to access in, in the Old Testament passages. For instance, in the Old Testament, the tree of life was in the Garden of Eden. Well, who was in the Garden of Eden? As far as we know, as far as the story is concerned, Adam and Eve and whoever they would have birthed. But we also know that in concept, the world was filled with human beings. We don't have anything to declare that human beings had access to the tree of life. Neither did they have access to the Garden of Eden. Just like people who were living during the times of the nation of Israel as they occupied the promised land, they may have had rights to live in the promised land, but they didn't have rights to inherit the promised land as heirs of God's family. So when we look at Revelation chapter 22, verse 2, we see the tree of life being made available not just to particular groups of people, but essentially to the entire nation. It is a source of healing for everyone. Who is the everyone? Who are the people that have access to this tree of life? All those who will receive the Son, Jesus Christ. That's the implication in this text, that everyone now has access. How do we get access? We get access through Jesus Christ. And that is the point that is trying to be portrayed in this text. Now, the reference to the tree of life itself is intentional okay it's intentional because the prophet spoke about the tree of life as a source of healing if you will um that would be given to people during the time where god would restore his people all right and we see this in uh, ezekiel chapter 47 verse 12 
where it states all kinds of trees. This is Ezekiel, you know, speaking here and in passing a reference, all kinds of trees providing food will grow along the banks of the river. Their leaves will not wither and their fruit will not fail. This is the way of the prophet speaking of a time of restoration, what God is doing during that period where he brings his, where he's bringing his people together and he's restoring them back to a place of prominence before they were, uh, if you will, uh, oppressed by these these nations. Each month they will bear fresh fruit because the water comes from the sanctuary. So you see the alignment between the waters that is found around the throne of God, the sanctuary, the temple, and their fruit will be used for eating their leaves for healing. So when we go back to Revelation, we know that this is not some random reference to the tree of life, but rather it is a concept that we find in the Old Testament spoken of by the prophets who envisioned a time where God's people will have a sort of healing. How do we depict that? Well, we, we look at passages like Ezekiel, Genesis, that talked about the tree of life. Now, if I'm living during this time, I'm getting excited because I'm imagining, not from a literal perspective, but from a very practical perspective, that what Adam, and God, Adam enjoyed in the garden is essentially and in principle what we are going to get through Jesus Christ. The time has come. And if I wanted to understand what that time looks like and what happens during those times, then I look at these Old Testament passages and how they're depicting a time of providence, protection, and presence. All right, those three things, providence, protection, and presence. The providence of God, the protection of God, and the presence of God. That's what these references are trying to portray to the people who are reading them. All right, let's go a little further. There will no longer be any curse. Now, right here, you see that he is inching over into the book of Zechariah, who, again, was an exilic prophet, if you will. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will worship. So here we are. Again, we're looking at the forest and not focusing on the trees. And in doing that, you understand that he is using some sort of uh, reference to something said before him and it, again it's a trigger for everyone who uh no offense uh intended who read their bibles all right <laughs> they would have gotten this very clearly zechariah chapter um 14 verse 11 says the people will live there and never again will there be a curse of complete destruction think about what that means think about being in this time where um you're a saint right you're living in obedience to god's word but yet you're still facing all sorts of oppression, persecution, and, and trouble. Your immediate mindset will think, well, dog, we did something wrong. We're being cursed. God is angry with us, and this is why we're experiencing what we're experiencing. But here, the text is showing us, Zechariah spoke to the nation of Israel saying, yes, you're going through this destruction. Yes, Jerusalem is being uh, defiled and desecrated and destroyed. But the curse is going to be lifted. And Jerusalem will dwell in security. Remember, we said just a moment ago, presence, protection, and providence. And what he's saying here is there will be a day where God will protect Jerusalem. He will provide security. He's going to do what he said he was going to do. Now, the question would be, why? Why will God send protection? Is it so the people of God can just sit in the land and do what they've always done? No. Remember, the only reason God gave Israel the land in the first place was so that they can establish a testimony in the world that will allow people to see how to worship him so that they might be invited and taught what it means to worship the one true God. Now, we live in a time today where we are not taught simply by visiting Jerusalem as to take a, a journey or some sort of, you know, a visit to a sacred temple. But as Jesus said to the woman at the well, the time will come when they who worship will no longer worship at this place or any other place, but they will worship in spirit and in truth. And so the great message of Revelation, as we're seeing here, the curse being lifted, is that now God is allowing everyone through his son, Jesus Christ, to be, be off of the restrictions, out of the curse that prohibited them from using a particular space or a particular area, there's no curse there. We don't need a curse there because we're not looking to those areas to worship any longer. There's only one way to worship, and you won't have to worry about how you go to a particular place to keep ordinances or do certain things that allow you to be subject to a curse. 
because of your disobedience and your rebellion. No, we're, we're, we're doing a new thing. We're doing a new way now. And this is why the curse is actually able to be lifted because the son has cre created a new way, a new means, and might, might I even say the only means to worship and be accepted before the father. So therefore, anyone who is in him can no longer be under a curse. All right. The throne of God and of the lamb will be in the city and his servants will do what? Worship him. You see that? Look how beautiful that is. The servants will do what? Worship. Because in the city, the only purpose and the only reason we're granted access to the city is to worship. All right. Now, again, remember, this is symbolic language. This is a way of portraying a particular meaning by use of Old Testament writings. And what is the point of this text? God has created a new way and an eternal way to worship him. How? Through the lamb who is his son, Jesus Christ. All right. Let's go a little further. It says they will see his face and his name will be on their foreheads. You see that? Remember the, the language of the foreheads? You either belong to Caesar or you belong to God. And whoever's name is on your forehead is the, the term, is what determines who you belong to. All right. You can't have Caesar's name on your forehead and claim to belong to God. And neither can you have God's name on your forehead and claim to belong to Caesar. You had to choose which one you would serve. And that would be the, the a determining factor on what would happen to you during these days where God will make his rule apparent. He would demonstrate without question that he is truly the ruler of the world. All right. Um, now, look at this. Night will be no more. Now, look at this interesting phrase. Night will be no more. What a, what an interesting way. I mean, like what what is what is he saying here? Will we be in a city where we don't need any light? I mean, many we can always take that that passage extremely literally. Um, but. But, but is there something else there, right? And that's the biggest question we have to always ask when reading apocalyptic language. Is there something else there? And quite frankly, there is. Because in Zechariah chapter 14, verse 7, Zechariah makes a reference to being in a period or being in a position where we don't need any light or day. Because, you know, the Lord, if you will, is the light. Look at, look at what he says here. Um... He says, on that day, there will be no light. The sunlight and the moonlight will diminish. It will be a unique day known only to the Lord without day or night. But there will be light at evening. So you see in, in the book of Zechariah, he makes reference to a time where there will be no need for light. And what he's essentially saying is, you know, this is the ultimate sign of God's restoration. Now, he's borrowing from, from some of the other prophets. Remember, the prophets never said anything different. They just said it again. All right. If we ever wanted to realize, recognize what are the prophets saying, they're never saying anything new. They're just saying the same thing that was said before in a, new, in a new day, because seemingly people forgot what these things mean and how they should be understood. So if we go even further back to Zechariah, Isaiah, in his depiction of God's eternal redemption and rule in fact if you were to read isaiah chapter 55 56 and really throughout the entire rest of the book the rest of the book you'll see about this this idea that he has about the glory of israel that will return due to the presence of the messiah and the rule of god it's a very beautiful and poetic description of what it means for god to to, to rule and in isaiah chapter 60 verse 19 no, notice what he states here look at what he says he says the sun just depicting the, Jeru the, the re restoration of Jerusalem. The sun will no longer be your light by day, and the brightness of the moon will not shine on you. The Lord will be your everlasting light, and your God will be your splendor. Your sun will no longer set, and your moon will not fade, for the Lord will be your everlasting light, and the days of your sorrow, catch this, will be over. That's the key. The days of your sorrow. So what he's really trying to explain here is the end of sorrow. But, but poetically, how does he do it? Well, he describes it in terms of the sun no longer needing to light your day. The moon no longer needing to, to, to light the night because God is your everlasting light. <laughs> Isn't that a beautiful way to talk about God? I mean, you think about this. Think about how beautiful this, this language is and the point of depicting God as being the, the solution to your sorrow, your literal sorrow that you're experiencing. 
how do I depict that? Well, I use terms like God will be my everlasting light. And so when Jesus comes into the world, guess what he says? I am the light of the world. Why is he saying this? Because people read literature that depicted a time where God would be their light. And so when Jesus comes to the world, he says, I am the light of the world. I, I am the light of the world. And then he even says to us, you all are called to be light in the world. But you can't be light in the world unless you're connected to the light of the world. So you see these play on words, these uh, borrowing from different concepts. And there are other scriptures as well that speak about this concept of God being the light, notably in, in the book of Psalm. But that's the point. So night will be no more. People, night having a, a, a connotation of being a, a time of uh, sorrow. Remember the text, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. These concepts are all throughout the text, and it, it is a point that is emphasized in, in Revelation. Night will be no more. People will not need the light of a lamp, but the light of the sun, because the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. Then he said to me, these words are faithful and they're true. The Lord, the God of the spirits and the prophets, or the spirits of the prophets. That's a very good thing there because he it shows the connection between what he's saying now and what has been said before. The God of the spirits of the prophets has sent his angel to show his servants what must soon take place. All right, what happened here? Oh, there we go. It says, look, I'm coming soon. That word, uh, erkamai in the Greek, which is a unique word, uh, which means I am arriving at a certain destination. I wish I could just find, uh, um, uh, it traditionally means I'm greeting you, if you will. I'm greeting, I'm arriving, uh, I'm coming soon. Blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. Remember Revelation chapter 2 and 3. The whole point of the book is to encourage people to hold on because there's something coming down the pipeline that you don't want to be caught off guard with. So keep doing what you're doing and do everything I tell you to do because there are there's a reward coming for those who hold on, but there's judgment that will come. Or should I say uh, wrath that will come to those who who don't. And here's that being here that is being emphasized in verse seven. He says, I, John, am the one who heard and saw these things. When I heard and saw them, I fell down to worship at the feet of the angel who had showed them to me. Interesting how man always seems to uh, be tempted to worship what I might consider um, angelic or spiritual beings. And here, here the angel is going to correct him. Yeah, Sister Neely says, Jesus states that he is the word of life as well. I, I'm just saying that, but that's exactly right. Jesus is depicted as the water or, yeah, the word of life. And, and all of that is based on the old Old Testament usage of, of uh, if you will, um, poetic language. And it's very important for us to draw the correlation when we're reading. So here, John is receiving all this. The angel, he's, he's revealing this to him. He falls down the worship. But notice what the angel states. Perfect answer to this kind of behavior. Don't do that. <laughs> I am a fellow servant with you. Your brothers, the prophets, and those who keep the words of this book worship God. I'm a fellow servant with you, your brothers, the prophet. He says, don't, and those who keep the words of this book. So don't worship me. He says, worship God. What a beautiful and appropriate answer or response to what, um, what John does here. Now it says here, then he said to me, don't seal up the words of, now here, here's something really good. Um, because he says, don't seal up the words of this book. Now that's important because there were instances where prophets received the word from the Lord and they were told to seal it. Let me give you an example. Isaiah chapter 8, verse 16, where Isaiah, who probably were, was one of the first to prophesy about these things in such a direct way. I mean, you talk about people saying, uh, you know, you ever heard people say, oh, he was way before his time. If there's anybody in the Bible who was way before his time, it was Isaiah. Because I, Isaiah's scope of prophecy is so broad. It is unbelievable. I mean, he's prophesying about Assyria. And this is before any of this stuff happens. This is before the Assyrians take over uh, the the, uh, the Israelites' territory. This is before the Babylonians come and capture Jerusalem. Yet he speaks about all these people. He calls Cyrus, who would be the leader of Persia, by name. 
So the breadth of his prophecy or his prophetic ministry is broad and it is very, very telling of what will happen. And here he is being told to bind up the testimony, seal up the instruction among my disciples. Because it's not for this time, but it will happen at an appointed time. This was typical, and we see it also in Daniel as he is prophesying as well. In Daniel chapter 8, verse 26, it says, The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true. You know, Daniel had several visions about what would happen between what we call the silent years or the intertestamental period between Malachi and Matthew. And here, the, the angel is telling him to seal up the vision because it refers to many days in the future all right he tells him again in chapter 9 verse 24 where he is receiving a prophecy he says 70 weeks are decreed about your people in your holy city to bring rebellion to an end to put a stop to sin to atone for iniquity to bring everlasting righteousness to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the holy or the anoint the most holy place so here we find several instances where Revelation is being given, but they're being told to seal it up. All right. But now that we are here, we don't have to do like Daniel had to do in, da in Daniel chapter 12, verse 4, where he's told to literally seal the book until the time of the end. Many will roam about and knowledge will increase. No, what God is saying here is don't seal the book up because the time is near. All right. Praise the Lord, Joy. Good to see you, brother. Thank you for joining us tonight. Love you, man. Thank you so much for being with us. He says, don't seal the book up. The words of the prophecy of this book, because the time of, or rather the time is near. So when we read the book of Revelation, friends, I hate to say this, but sometimes we, 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 we are miscontextualizing what is read. And therefore, it, it causes us to set false expectations. And I'm all for paralleling and not over paralleling, but of course, paralleling, understanding prophecy, ancient prophecy is all about paralleling in some respects. So I'm all for that. But the word I'm, 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 I'm afraid of is replicating, right? Because we can't replicate scripture to the point where we make things like this untrue. When John was told to not seal the words of the prophecy of this book because the time is near, he meant exactly what he said here. And if he said it was near, it had to be near. I mean, like right around the corner. Otherwise, he would have told him to do like the other prophets were told. Seal up the book because it's not many, it's many days away. We don't need to worry about it right now. Just want to give you a little glimpse of what's going to happen. But you can seal it up because you, don't, you shouldn't expect it to happen anytime soon. No, the word near literally means it's in close proximity. This is about to happen very 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 soon just like it said at the beginning of the book the words of this prophecy they are right around the corner all right let's go a little further and see what else he has to say it says let the unrighteous go on in unrighteousness let the filthy stay filthy stay filthy let the righteous go in or go on in righteousness let the holy still be holy again this is another passage uh that speaks to um alludes to something the prophet said and, and it's this idea of you know letting the one who listen listen let the one who refuses refuse in ezekiel chapter 3 verse 27 um and so you have like this idea almost like it's too late if you're not where you need to be now it's too late because remember what he just said what this prophecy stated was is going to happen is right around the corner so let the unrighteous go in, go on in unrighteousness. Let the filthy still be filthy. Let the righteous go on in righteousness. Let the holy still be holy. Look, I am arriving. I'm coming soon. And my reward is with me to repay each person according to their work. All right. And this is a very powerful passage because notice what he states. I'm going to repay each person according to his work. Now, when we as protestants we I mean, we just we're so anti-works and i get what we're trying to do but we, we just got to remember this book was written 
these books were written long ago. And because he uses the word works there, he's trying to point again the people back to an old idea and concept. We just cannot be so um, in a hurry to apply scripture and all of our new covenant voicings and theological understandings that we negate the point of the text. The reason he says this is because we've heard it said before. If you look at Psalm chapter 62, verse 12, he says, faithful, he says, let me go verse 11. God has spoken once. I've heard this twice. Strength belongs to God and faithful love belongs to you, Lord, for you repay each according to his work. It's not an accident that these passages are being used because he's trying to tie again what they're experiencing in the current moment to what has been said before. He will repay, Isaiah said, according to their deeds, fury to his enemies, retribution to his foes, and he will repay the coast and the islands. So you see this idea where God is taking vengeance on those, vengeance on those who op oppressed his people and did a contrary to what he commanded, which is the whole point of the book of Revelation in the first place, starting in chapter 2 and chapter 3. He says in Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 10, I, the Lord, examine the mind, I test the heart, to give each according to his way, according to what his actions deserve. All right? So there are several scriptures where we continue to see this, and it's all to say that God is fulfilling his word. He is showing us that what he said before has never changed. And so when Paul talks about these days, guess what he does? He's not looking to, to create some new doctrine or, or some new idea about you know, salvation. Paul is very clear that what God said before is applicable to us today. And guess what he does? In Romans chapter 2, verse 6, he says, He, that is God, has a day of wrath where he's going to judge the righteous with judgment. And in verse 6, he says this, He will repay each one according to his works. Eternal life to those who, by persistence in doing good, seek glory, honor, and immortality. But wrath and anger to those who are seek or who are self-seeking, look at that word, mm -mm, and disobey the truth while obeying unrighteousness. So when we get back to Revelation, this is not something new that John created. He is following the revelation of the Spirit who inspired all the other things that we read in scripture. And guess what he says? Jesus is coming with a reward to repay each person according to his work. He could have used the word faith there, but he used the word work because of all the other scriptures that are tied to the meaning of this passage. I hope that makes sense. And I'm only going through this because I want, this is how we, it, it, this is a good way to study the book of Revelation and particularly any apocalyptic writing because this is the way scripture is used to portray a point. All right. I am the alpha, he says, and the omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. This is a very powerful proclamation, which we've heard before. We've heard it and read it, rather, should I say, in Revelation 1 and 8. And uh, here it is at the end of the book, reiterating its strength and its point. Blessed are those who wash their robes, he says in verse 14. Who wash their robes so that they may have the right to the tree of life. Now, the idea of washing their robes in some ancient manuscripts, this right here, this phrase was translated keeping or keep the commandments, keep his commands. So some ancient manuscript says, blessed are those who keep his commands. And that's the point of the text. You're washing your robes because this is what God said, that he cannot have any unclean individuals following him or trying to enter into his covenant promises so you must wash yourself cleanse yourself wash their robes how do you how do i wash my robes in a more practical way well i'll keep the commandments of god which is the point of this entire book okay um let me see here all right it says so that they may have the right to the tree of life and may enter the city by the gates washing your robes means the actions that one must take in obedience to god to have these different things, access to tree of life and interest into the city, which we read in chapter 21 is actually a spiritual reality more than it is a spiritual or a manifested or material destination. Does that make sense? 
It is a spiritual reality more than it is a material destination. That's what chapter 21 shows us, the New Jerusalem. Now it says outside, okay, outside of the city, that is the place where we enjoy God's presence the, in communion and fellowship with him, outside of that city are dogs, which is a very negative term going back to the Old Testament in Hebrew, um, the sorcerers, <clears throat> the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Now notice, after all that has happened so far, these different entities, these different characters, if you will, still exist. The dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. But the, the more relevant and important point is where do they exist? They exist outside, okay, the city gates, meaning they have no place among the people of God. And that is what true victory looks like. It doesn't necessarily look like the destruction, re completely obliteration of these sort of things or characters, but it means the placement of these ones outside of the gate where God's name exists. And because the place is not a material place, but a communal experience with the one true living God, what is he, what he's essentially saying here is among God's people where God's presence can be found. There should be no sorcerers, no dogs, no sexually immoral people, no murderers, no idolaters, and no one who loves and practices falsehood. It's a description of the place where we saw in Revelation chapter 21, verse uh, three, what he calls his home. God's home, where God is at home, does not allow for these kinds of individuals or these kinds of characters, all right? And that is the point. It's the cleansing of God's household, if you will, so that we don't have to wonder who is who we know because they've been placed out as a part of God's judgment, all right? Now, notice what he says in verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent my angel to attest these things to you for the churches. I am the root and descendant of David, the bright morning star. That reference to a bright morning star. If you look at Numbers chapter 24, verse 17, I guess I can go here. That goes way back when he pulls that one out. Bright morning star. That goes way back uh, to Numbers. And notice what he says here. It's just a little reference to what it means for there to be a star. I see him, and this is where, let me see here. We go to Numbers chapter 24. Look at this, Balaam talking. A star will come, or the situation with Balaam, if you will. A star will come from Jacob, and a scepter will rise from Israel. Look at that re reference to a star. And what there's literally doing, what's happening is a play on Numbers 24, 17, which is really the only, that I could find, the only passage that we speak, that we find of a reference to a star being to Jesus Christ or the Son or the Messiah, if you will. And here is that reference to the star here being carried into Revelation chapter 22, verse 16, the bright morning star. How do we know? Well, look at the reference here before it. The root and the descendant of David, son of Jesse, as some referred to it, the bright morning star. It is a, a, a reference to Jesus' royalty, all right? And that is the point of, of making it here in this text. But your mind has to go all the way back to any reference that you can find that will refer to the Son of God, the Messiah, as being a star. And you can see where his mind is, is, is whenever he makes that reference. But verse 17, it says, Both the Spirit and the bride say, Come. What a, We've heard this before. Um, let's see here. Again, Isaiah had a depiction of God's glorious Jerusalem. And in that Jerusalem is a... Is a um, is the expectation of everyone being able to come in this city to drink freely. Remember the value of water, 
during this time. Look at Isaiah chapter 55 verse 1. And this is his idea of a restored, glorified Jerusalem where God is ruling. He's in control. It says, come everyone who is thirsty, come to, to the water and you without silver. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without silver and without cost. Imagine, again, the providence of God. The three things, providence, protection, and presence. In this newly restored city of God, there is no price. There is liberal access to all necessary resources because it is as close to a utopian society that we can find ever. I mean, from the very beginning, even better than the Garden of Eden. Why do you spend silver on what is not food and your wages on what does not satisf satisfy? Listen carefully to me and eat what is good and you will enjoy the choicest food. Pay attention and come to me. Listen so that you will live. I will make a permanent covenant with you on the basis of the faithful kindness of David. So when we get to Revelation, look what he says. The spirit and the bride say what? Come. Let anyone who hears come. Let anyone who is thirsty come. Let the one who desires take the water of life freely. What a beautiful text. I testify to everyone, he says, who hears the words of the prophecy of this book. If anyone adds to them the prophecy of this book, all right, I know we're not, we're not in principle, we're not supposed to add to the Bible, but just think about what is being said in this text more than anything. This prophecy is speaking of a specific time. And brothers and sisters, when we use the book of Revelation to say things that it is not saying, even for the sake of building practical applications for our times today, we are adding to the prophecy of this book, and it is dangerous. Okay? If anyone asks to them, God will add to him the plagues that are written in this book. So they were supposed to be very cautious not to add meaning and purpose and details to this book because it was specific to times that they were living in. It says, so is the book of Revelation more about the life of Jesus, the birth of the church, Jesus' death, the resurrection that conquered, than about future? Yep, exactly, Sister Neely. That's exactly what it is about. And the reason we know this, very good question, the reason we know this is because of the very first verse in the book. And by the time we get to chapter 22, we tend to forget this verse, but it says the revelation of Jesus Christ that God gave to show his servants what must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant, John, who testified to the word of God and catch this, the testimony of Jesus Christ. What do we know about Jesus? Who is he? What is this about? He showed him everything that he saw. So, this is about Jesus. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ and how the revelation of Jesus Christ is breaking through into the world of those who are living during these times so that they can understand who Jesus is, what his resurrection means to them, and how does it change the dynamics of their life, including the world powers that are oppressing those who live in commitment and obedience to who he really was. Now, the, the, the big struggle would be well, goodness gracious, um, this man is dead. He's not around. And here we are living according to this testimony that he got up. Is there any proof that we are in our right mind and doing the right thing? That's where all the details from chapter 4 to chapter 22 comes into place. If you really want to know that the testimony about Jesus Christ, what has been said, what is believed is true, here's how you know. These are things that are going to be done in specific order to show you that what is believed about Jesus is true. And whenever it's all said and done, he himself, he's going to show up and prove that he's not dead, that he really is worth believing in. That's the point of this book. And so at best, when we begin to take little tidbits from this chapter, from this book, and try to appropriate them to the 21st century, at best, what we can do is find the parallels to some sort of eternal truth. But to say that we are in some, some way, some way, we are realizing these words, again, is adding to the prophecy of this book. Okay, it's adding to it. 
And to go even further, notice what he says here. If anyone takes away from the words of this book, of this prophecy, God will take away his share of the tree of life. Well, who in this book, who was the tree of life promised to? Well, we're looking at seven churches, right? So what God is saying here, if you take away anything that this book says, I'm going to take your name out of the tree of life and the holy city, which are written about in this book. So he was telling them, don't you try to downplay this? Don't you try to exploit it or embellish this? Just take it for what I'm saying, and you will see that it is exactly what I said it will be. Now, look at what happens. He who testifies about these things say, here's John saying this, or Jesus rather, yes, I am coming soon. Amen. Look at the response. Come, Lord Jesus. Jesus says, he who testifies about these things says, yes, I am coming soon. The response was, so be it. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Why would they say that? Well, let me go back here. Let me just show you why they would say that really quick. Why would they say, unlike us, we would say because we're frightened by it. All right. And we're nervous about it. We're saying, Lord, oh, gosh, we can't stand what's going on in this book. They're saying, come, Lord Jesus, come soon. Why? They're saying it because in Revelation, verse 1 and verse 9, here's what their reality was, unlike us. Look at what he says. John says, I'm your brother, your partner in the affliction, the kingdom, and endurance that are in Jesus. I'm on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. John is being afflicted like every other believer in Jesus is being afflicted during this time. And the question is, Lord, how long and what should we expect? What are you going to do about this? So the response is, essentially, I'm coming. I'm on my way. I'm going to free you from this. It's going to be over with very soon. And John's response is, amen. Come, Lord Jesus. All right. Now, look at this last verse. The grace of of the Lord Jesus be with everyone. Amen. Now imagine you're a, you're a first century believer. You're receiving this book. And this is the letter you just got through reading. Now remember, we read this over 22 weeks. Right? They would have read this in one setting. The entire thing. The entire letter. And it wouldn't have taken them long. But they would have read it and they would have understood it. They would have had that digested and dissected it. Because they are living in the moment. And they would have left that letter or that meeting after the letter was read that John revealed to them by the word and revelation of Jesus Christ being completely consoled, completely um, inspired and motivated and hopeful that everything they're going through is worth it. Because guess what he just got through saying? He says, I am coming soon. I'm coming. It's kind of like when you're in high school. You know, and you're, um, let's say you're getting bullied by a couple of friends, right? And your big cousin says, or your big brother says, sends you a message. Don't worry, I'll be there at the, at the end of fourth block. I'm going to be there. Just hold on. Don't worry. At the fourth block, I'm going to show up. You might look at there and it's 30 minutes before fourth block and you got these guys around you ready to jump on you. But the closer it gets to the end of fourth block, the more excited and the more hopeful you become because you know if you can just make it to the end of fourth block, your big brother, your big cousin is going to be right around the corner. That's kind of the feeling that these saints are having. If we can just make it to the end of all of these events we just heard about, we know that Jesus is going to come and free us and defeat our enemies in the fashion that he mentioned in this book. That's the point. And... We don't always get that in the 21st century. And because of that, we've heard a lot of things said about the book of Revelation. And ultimately, it, it never pans out the way we say it. Because we are miscontextualizing it at some points. That's, you know, that's just the nature of reading the Bible. And we, we all can do it if we're not careful. So the book of Revelation, I wish I had my clapper, but it's not here. So I have to clap myself, all right? The book of Revelation, we finished it. I hope this all makes sense. I, I, my, my wife declares I love the book of Revelation. I actually, it's not my favorite book, but I think it's a necessary book. 
I think it's a book that we should study at least once a year at some point uh, just to refresh our minds and keep ourselves situated. So the question many will say, if we're reading the book of Revelation contextually and we're understanding it as a prophetic message to people living there in that time, why should we read it today? What does it say to us? Here's what it says to us. This is why we should read it. In our own generation, we're going to face our share of oppression and persecution. And we all will be faced with the challenge of maintaining our holiness and our commitment to Jesus Christ in a world where it would be more profitable and beneficial to forsake Jesus for the pleasures and the comfort of this world. And the message to us is never do that. Never make that sacrifice or that exchange because in God's own timing, he will demonstrate that working, serving, and living for him is far more valuable than any other thing you can commit yourself to. And quite frankly, there is nothing in this world that can provide you with a better reward than the one you will get for standing for the testimony of Jesus Christ. That's the message. That's the point. And in what way that may manifest in our lives and in our generation, that's always the point. May it come through some sort of persecution on the job. May it come through some sort of hostility from the government. May it come through some, you know, uh, absurd uh, relationships or uh, oppression from our family. Whatever that looks like in our world, and our generation, in our lives, the point is still the same. Hold on, because you want your name written in the book of life. You want your candle to remain on the lampstand. You want to be the generation the people within your generation that will be found in the city gates and not outside the city gates. So that's the point. And that will always be the absolute message and the absolute truth of this wonderful revelation because the king is here, the son is alive, and he still fights for his people. All right. So friends, thank you all so much for hanging in there with me. It's been a long 22 weeks uh, or maybe longer than that, but we made it. We made it, and thank God for the revelation of Jesus Christ, the ability to know who he is truthfully and to see him as the king and ruler that he is for all generations. So I hope this has been helpful. Um, we have a lot to pray for in our world. There are a lot of things happening around us, and ultimately the, the answer to what is happening in our world is Jesus Christ. Jesus makes everything better. He brings peace when there should be no peace. He brings relationship when there should be no relationship or reconciliation. And ultimately, when we root or find our identity in Christ, do we find all that God has for us in this world? So that's the answer. And that's something to pray towards as we see events and things happen and unfold around us. Um, the answer is Jesus Christ. And it doesn't get any more simple than that. It's just that Jesus is the answer in every way. All right. So we pray that God will bless us in these times we're in and that he will allow us to be a light in this very dark world and that we will have the courage to stand as these churches were instructed to stand in their own generation. All right. So, friends, thank you all so much for joining me tonight. We'll be back next week, 6 o'clock, 1215 Calhoun Street. Next Saturday is Fall Fest. Come on out and have some nachos, hot dogs, chips, drinks. You have a lot of fun if you're um, looking for a nice festive event. And your kids will get to eat free, so you don't have to pay for your kids to eat anything. If you're an adult, you're going to have to help us out on this one. But <laughs> but the kids will be uh, able to eat from a food truck that we have coming in to provide all the food and it's going to be a great time and i hope you all will be able to join us all right so until next time thank you all for watching take care and god bless